should be working. Um, so uh, a long way of saying we're open for business. Nothing's changed for us. Um, the market is slightly different. I think we're seeing, like I said, uh, who are the hardworking founders who want to fight through this. Okay, now we're up and running. All right. I, I will give my preamble again. <laughs> we are now live. We're live on YouTube. So, hey, everybody uh, on YouTube, just to give the shortest of preambles for the YouTube audience. Uh, we have an accelerator. Uh, Jackie here uh, runs it with me. Uh, this is our 25th accelerator class. We always have seven companies. We always put 100K into the company. It is about 16 weeks. And the accelerator really serves two purposes, uh, to help founders uh, who have products in market, a little bit of traction, increase their traction, tell their story, meet investors, uh, and grow their revenue, maybe do projections, uh, really accelerate. That's what we call an accelerator, not an incubator. You know, these are companies that already have real products with real customers uh, universally. And uh, we have Founder University, which is a program for people who don't yet have finished products. And you can go to founder.university and look at that. Uh, but here, uh, we work with companies uh, like I said, over 16 weeks. And then most often we will wind up syndicating the companies. So maybe out of the last three classes, 21 companies, Jackie will tell me, but 15, 16 of them, we probably syndicated a couple of them, maybe didn't clear more. market. And it's more, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then a couple of them maybe didn't fundraise. So there wasn't an opportunity for us to invest, but our intent in our accelerator is when they graduate to if they do a good job and they're raising money and the valuation is reasonable and the deal terms are clean to syndicate them. And so we've done 265 syndicates, uh, the largest number of syndicate deals by any firm um, by a large margin uh, at the syndicate.com. So that's what we do. Uh, thanks to the audience for showing up and you're going to love these companies. Uh, one of the things you can do to support the companies other than invest in them, if you choose to do that and you do your diligence uh, and you're an accredited investor, um, is to try their products and maybe spread the word about their products if you know somebody who might be interested in using them and they almost universally have open positions. Jackie, I'll hand it over to you now. All right, awesome. Thank you, Jason. Welcome everyone, LA25 Public Demo Day. Um, welcome to our guest investor judges. We have seven judges here as panelists and we also have syndicate members who are um, will be in the Q&A box. So we'll make sure to get some questions in for there. Um, the companies here you'll meet will present for exactly three minutes. We time them and then I'll go around to our investor guest judges here and get some questions and they'll have exactly two minutes to answer those questions. So it'll give us a uh, uh, going along in a nice clip. At the end, I will ask our judges for their top three of the seven. Um, to kick us off though, I will ask our investor judges to quickly introduce yourselves. We'll go around. And if you could just say your name, firm, average check size, and if you have a thesis, um, let's start with you, Alejandra. Welcome. Thanks, Jackie. Um, Alejandra here. I'm an associate at B Partners. Uh, average check size is a million dollars. We invest at the pre-seed and seed, so it's never too early. Um, and specifically focused on B2B deep tech startups. Thanks, Alejandra. Andrea, welcome. Oh, you're on mute. Yes, I just realized that halfway through. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Andrea. Super excited to be here. Um, uh, my firm is called XG Ventures. We are um, original Google employees. So that's the X and the G. And our average check size varies. It can be as little as you know, 50K all the way up to high six figures. Um, we are early seed stage investors. So we definitely like to see some traction. Um, we're pretty much sector agnostic. The only sector we don't, well, actually two sectors we don't really touch anymore are um, gaming and uh, medical uh, equipment uh, type sectors. And um, We've been doing this for 14 years. So we're salty veterans and over a hundred companies in our portfolio. Thank you, Andrea. Atin, welcome. Thanks, Jackie. Um, hey folks, my name is Atin. I'm the founder and sole GP of a firm called 27V. Uh, we invest exclusively in education and future of work companies. Uh, investing globally at the pre-seed and seed stage, average checks has about 150,000. Though I've done anything from about 25 all the way up to 500,000 um, in certain deals. Uh, we do lead pre-seed rounds uh, and then follow um, at both pre-seed and seed. So right, that's thank me. You. Thank you, Atin. David, hi. Hi there, I'm David. I'm a partner at Maveron. We are a 
consumer only fund that specializes in direct to consumer brands and direct to consumer companies. Uh, our typical check size, we almost exclusively do lead series A's. So we typically write a check in the four to $8 million range. Although on occasion we'll do a pre-seed or a seed in either a team or a um, category that we get really excited about spending some earlier time on. Um, and we, in the last year and a half, became a certified B Corp. So we're super excited about that. And I, in particular, spend most of my time looking in and around what I would call the, the reinvention of entertainment. All right. Thanks, David. Love your virtual background. <laughs> thanks. All right. And we have two Pascals today. Pascal Unger, we'll start with you. That's good. Thank you. Um, so Pascal, GP at Darling Ventures. Um, we're a pre-seed fund, which for us means um, we tap out at about a uh, round size of $2 million, $10 million post money valuations, um, invest up to 750k um, into software, B2B software startups um, in the US and Canada. Um, sorry for the background noise. <laughs> no worries. Thanks. And Pascal from Storm. Hey guys, uh, Pascal Jen, partner at Storm Ventures. We uh, specialize in B2B enterprise software. We don't do any B2C um, and we usually jump in at a product market fit stage. So we usually lead series A uh, check size between one and five million. All right. Thanks so much. And welcome to, to our syndicate members. Um, investor guest judges, if you have a question that you know that you're going to have, you can just write QQ in the chat room and I'll call on you after the founder's pitch. Otherwise, I will call on you in alphabetical order, but feel free to write a question in there anytime. And for syndicate members, we have a Q&A box if you could go ahead and write your questions there and be sure to tag the name of the uh, founder or the company so they know it's for them and we can an answer them live. All right, we'll bring up our first founder. We have Pete from Chatter. Are you ready to go, Pete? Hey there. Yes, I'm ready. Let me All right. get going. Tell me Let's when. Let's do this. All right, three, two, go. Hey there, my name's Pete. Uh, I'm the founder of Chatter and we're connecting the world's manufacturing data. The things we use in our daily lives, like this iPhone housing here, started off as raw material. The machines that do this work today are incredibly complex and automated. They can do the work of an entire floor of factory workers in just a fraction of the time. Here's a real world example, a customer of ours named CJ. He has a machine that makes thousands of parts per month for the semiconductor industry. Now in manufacturing, time is money. To him, 150 bucks an hour. He plans out an 18 hour day of production, but the real world is messy. Things go wrong along the way, like broken tools or bad parts. He has a problem. While his equipment is super automated, the software layer running it is a carryover from the 70s. It literally looks like this. It can't communicate with him and it can't think. That's where chatter comes in. We sent him this box, he plugged it in, and within 15 minutes, he had a live dashboard showing him exactly what his machine's doing, his productivity overall, as well as how they've been doing historically and places he and his team can improve. When something goes wrong, like a broken tool, he actually gets a text message about it now so he can address the issue head on. But we don't just wanna be a notification system, like that's great, but we wanna solve these problems. Chatter aggregates his data and predicts when his tools are gonna to break before they even break. Using this, he's completely eliminated this kind of costly failure from happening in his shop. According to CJ, he literally can't function without Chatter at this point. And I promise we didn't pay him to say this. Uh, on average, we save him 12 hours a month, which translates into $1,800 of production time on that single machine. Extrapolate that over the over half million machines in the US, that's $12.4 billion per year in value created. And that's just our beta product. So here's how it works. We have this box, it connects to all major brands of machine tools, sends their data up to an API where we process it as if someone's actually understanding that and combine it with data from the other pieces of software our customers are already using, then display it on a web app to the user. We don't charge for the hardware integration. It's just 80 bucks a month per machine or $600 a year per machine. Each device costs us 45 bucks and supports up to 25 machines at a single site. Right now we're in beta with 87 machines across 33 shops, 25% month over month growth and 21K in ARR. We're currently focusing on our beachhead market of small CNC machine shops, SMBs like CJs, then developing new functionality as paid modules, then expanding into other manufacturing verticals like 3D printing, injection molding and more. The competition's out there, but look at these stats. They're dropping the ball. Only 24% of shops have even one machine connected to a monitoring service. Everyone else says we're planning on it, but they haven't done it. Why is that? Well, I'll tell you. I've been a shop owner myself for seven years. I've lived this frustration. The incumbents are too expensive, take too long to set up, and are super hard to use. Chatter was built from the ground up to solve all these problems. Instead of just disjointed data on charts, we actually process it so it makes sense from the office down to the production floor. 
We have a killer team with experience across machining, sales, software development, and robotics. Thank you so much for checking out Chatter. My name's Pete, and we're connecting the world's manufacturing data. All right. Well done, Pete. Thank you. Okay, investors, we'll start with you for questions. Alejandra, question for Pete. Hi, Pete. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. I really like um, what you covered at the beginning in terms of like your land and expand and why you're so much better at that stage. Um, I'm wondering, though, you know, once it's already set up and everything, uh, and given that the buyer is not always going to be the user of your product, how do you ensure that the users are making the most out of the platform? And how do you continue to show ROI? Thanks. Uh, All right. Thank you. Andrea, question for me. Yeah, um, likewise. I mean, definitely seems like this industry is ripe for disruption. So that definitely means um, opportunity. Um, my question, though, is, and it's probably because I don't understand enough about manufacturing, but um, why a box? And is it just, is the box temporary? Because um, I'm wondering if maybe you can sort of remove that idea. And then what industries work better than others? You'd mentioned uh, 3D printing, but I was just sort of curious, like, what's your sweet spot of manufacturing industries that work best? All right. Thanks so much. Atin, question for Pete. Hey, thanks, Pete. Um, I have a simple question, just trying to understand what kind of um, data sources you use, you're using to actually come up with the predictions of when the machines are breaking. Is there a, um, a set of sensors on the machine itself that you're using, or actually there's a set of sensors that you're adding yourself? Um, just keen to understand um, how you're making those predictions. All right, terrific. Thanks. So let's grab one from our syndicate member. Um, can you expand a little bit on your expansion and go to market strategy? You have two minutes to answer those questions. Three to go. All right. I'll see if I can do it in two minutes. Um, as far as um, hey, you know how this uh, translates to users in different capacities, the beauty of being a productivity software that also provides the solutions for the problems we're identifying is we can actually show them month over month um, how you know utilizing different features on our uh, platform is affecting their bottom line productivity. So I mean that's really powerful, and it's just sort of something that's built into the way. You know, it's, it's just inherent. If, if you're collecting the data, you can both analyze it and you can use it um, to, you know, create improvements. Uh, Andrea, as far as the box, um, that is temporary probably for the next two to three years. Someone can run this software on their computer, but we find that the best user experience and the cleanest onboarding is with a dedicated hardware device. Uh, these machines are slowly moving in a direction where uh, they will be able to contact a cloud endpoint like on their own. And we're actually, you know, sort of tight with the people who are developing the standards for this because that's something we really want. Like we want competition in this space because we want to prove we're the best and we want cost customers to onboard easily and not have to pay for hardware at the same time. Um, Atin, as far as our data sources, uh, the machines have all, they have an amazing amount of sensors built into them. So we collect, I think right now it's like 34 different data points that we collect. Uh, the Chatter platform, I mean, you can look at it on our site, but I think we're at like 26 million data points collected uh, overall. Um, and, and we can derive this without installing any sensors besides just the connector box on site. Um, as far as the syndicate question, I didn't catch who asked that, um, but our expansion and our go to market. Um, essentially, we are doing a few really cool things. Um, number one, we have sort of the classic B2B sales cycle, uh, which is relatively expensive. Um, but what we're really excited about is the way we're actually partnering with distributors who are selling these machines in order to put chatter um, onto the machines that they're selling new and then expand out throughout that shop. So we sort of get an in because B2B sales is really tough and very expensive. If we can stay with someone that they already trust and get in that way, um, that's sort of our key to success there. Uh, that's my time. So thank you so much for your questions. I appreciate it. All right. Well done, Pete. That's two minutes. It's tough. Great job. Okay. Thanks. Up next up, we have, all right, Freedom, you're all ready to go. Thank you. And Absolutely. Good afternoon. <laughs> all right. Three, two, go. My name is Freedom. I am the co-founder of Spring Eats. We do waste-free deliveries from farm to table. Single-use packaging is America's dumbest problem. 10 to 30% of a product's cost as packaging. It's even more inefficient and wasteful with delivery. Packaging adds to the cost of food and contributes 29% of American carbon emissions. Spring Eats is the opportunity to do waste-free grocery profitably. Here are the unit economics on just one item, a pound of strawberries. We are fully vertically integrated, so we are able to buy at a low cost and sell at a higher price. I hear you thinking, 
but we are not making the same mistakes as recently failed startups. Our models efficiencies create an entirely new category and incumbents are completely ill-equipped to transition operations. Our customer, Susan, places her order online and then Voila, she receives her groceries in 100% reusable packaging delivered in an EV. On Susan's next delivery, she returns the packaging to us. We wash everything and reintegrate it into our system. Susan says the products are great quality and delivery is seamless. Spring Eats is a waste-free intelligent system. Does your pantry look like this? Well, our members have beautiful Instagrammable pantries. Additionally, members and suppliers can track their impact with every delivery. The current food system is broken, but with our data model, we're building efficiencies in inventory management and last mile logistics. On the supply side, we buy wholesale directly from farmers, producers, and makers. Our sourcing partner, Jessica, says Spring Eats is the only way for us to transition to a waste-free circular model. The result is Susan enjoying farm-fresh strawberries in our stainless steel clamshells. 82% of all our customers ordered every week for over five months. Our typical cart size is $110 as compared to the $75 industry standard. With a 97% return rate on reusables, we have de-risked this business. Our BTEC customers are active members of environmental groups. One Sierra Club chapter alone can drive us to profitability in Washington, D.C., we have monthly subscription fees of $25 and our margins are 5x as compared to other grocery delivery. Spring Eats is an alternate food distribution system. Our infrastructure unlocks partnership opportunities with commercial kitchens and large campuses. Our first goal is to lead the waste-free delivery category in the mid-Atlantic with a SAM of 25 billion. Our team specializes in management, circular supply chains, and grocery. This is a picks and shovels climate business. Let's build profitable and waste-free supply chains. I am Freedom. Thank you. All right, Freedom. Well done. Thank you. Um, Anna, welcome. You came in a couple minutes late. Would love for you to ask Freedom a question and also introduce yourself, please. Uh, name, firm, average check size, and if you have a thesis. Cool. Sounds good. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Anna Doherty, a partner at G9 Ventures. Uh, we invest in consumer-facing companies in the positive living space across digital and physical products and services. Check size ranges um, from anything as small as 50K to as large as 5 million. Primarily do early stage investing, but we'll opportunistically invest in growth companies, kind of series B to pre-IPO, so very broadly defined. Um, my question uh, for Freedom is, can you just walk us through what um, your unit economics look like today and then at scale, if you have time, including, you know, all variable costs associated with delivering products to your customers, as well as customer acquisition costs? All right. Thank you, Anna. David. Hi, Freedom. I love what you're doing. I think this is a great idea, but I also have been humbled by how difficult this is logistically, especially once you get to hyperscale. I'm curious to know a little bit more about your team on the operation side and, and how much experience they have in this difficult area. All right, terrific. Thank you. Andrea is asking, any thoughts to partner with Imperfect Foods? <laughs> <laughs> great. And uh, we'll grab one more. Pascal Unger, how about you? Yeah. Um, so I've also looked at, at some companies that that do reverse logistics and everything. And, and, and I said, given that it's um, it's very um, complex, um, what parts are you actually looking to do yourself um, versus outsourcing, and how much of that changes as you're actually thinking about scaling the business? All right. Terrific. We can tackle those. Freedom. Two minutes, please. Sure. Thank you for the questions, everybody. I, I think the underlying piece here is just fear for infrastructure. And we're living in a time where it's easier to imagine colonizing Mars, but it is more difficult to imagine building new forms of public infrastructure to feed 8 billion people. And I just do not agree with that. Uh, the way we're doing this is by building efficiencies that simply don't exist in the existing food system, including the delivery system. We're different because of the data model in place. We're different because last mile logistics is an entirely different ballgame for us. Some specifics here. Uh, most businesses make a mistake with 30 minute, 20 minute 
two hour deliveries. What we have is a system called community delivery days where we are clubbing deliveries based on zip codes. And when we do clustered home deliveries, we are saving money on last mile logistics. And we are not driving empty vehicles. Customers expect impact for us. And that's exactly what we are delivering at every level. Anna, with respect to unit economics, uh, customers on average order from us every week. You're looking at about $5,000 spent by one household on our store yearly. We have a 15% profit margin. You're looking at about $700. With a $300 subscription fee, you're looking at $1,000 in net profit. Now, the deeper part of this question is how do we scale? by not making mistakes that other businesses have made. We're very focused on one part of the District of Columbia. Methodology and discipline is the heart of scaling in this business. And that's because we are able to leverage that infrastructure to deliver to the rest of DC and then to the DMV, which is the DC metro area, and eventually to our goal, which is the mid-Atlantic market with a SAM of 25 billion. Um, David, on the operation side, we're building uh, a team that comes from the grocery industry. Our director of operation comes with about 14 years in the grocery industry. We have advisors with over 20 years experience in the space. Andrea, vertical integration is key to success. Operational fragmentation is the biggest challenge oh, in this. Okay, uh, sorry, Fredo. <laughs> Two minutes is tough. Great job, though. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, everybody. And also, founders, please do keep an eye out for the Q&A box for more questions there. Um, all right, next up, we have Seth from Gifting. Founder you alum. Are you ready? Seth, you have three minutes, please. I am. Hello three there. Three to go. Hi, I'm Seth, founder of Gifting, an on-demand gift-giving marketplace. Meet Robert, one of our users who lives in California and just remembered that today is his parents' anniversary. But they live in Florida, so what can he get them and will it even arrive in time? Luckily, this isn't a problem for Robert because there's Gifting. Robert opens up his Gifting app and enters in his parents' interests. From there, our machine learning gets to work. Alternatively, if he had something specific in mind, say a digital picture frame so his parents could see the latest photos of their first grandchild, he can enter that in too. Robert is provided with a list of items available in his parents' area to choose from. His order, well, that comes with a video message that can be viewed for up to 30 seconds. He then goes ahead and can have it delivered in as little as two hours. As for Robert's gift, that's accompanied with a text message containing his delivery information and personal greeting. His mom is so excited, she chooses to share the gift on her favorite social media platform, leaving us with two happy customers. And they're not alone. Users overwhelmingly agree. It's easy to use, provides an on-demand service worth paying for, and they're referring it to others. While we hope to get it right the first time, we know that that's not always the case. So we've solved for this by allowing gift recipients to exchange the gift prior to delivery which provides a major benefit for retailers and addresses retail losses that result in close to $67 billion annually on gifts. Not to mention the additional benefit to the planet by shrinking the 6 billion pounds of waste and 16 metric tons of CO2 caused by these gift returns. Since launching in our pilot market last month, we've had over 5,000 downloads. Our business model organically creates a minimum of two impressions for every gift given, plus the additional brand exposure garnered for every social media post, keeping our CAC low. Our total addressable market is made up of 3.5 billion gifts with a SAM of approximately 148 million gifts. This translates to 1 billion in revenue in 2025 and nearly 4 billion by the end of the decade. Our business model is comprised of four primary revenue streams. First, our B2C revenue streams consist of platform fees and personalization plus ups. Second, our B2B revenue streams consist of commissions directly from our retail partners and in-app sponsorship opportunities. When fully stood up, gifting has about a 50% profit margin and that increases with each subsequent order. And unlike our on-demand competitors, gifting is profitable from order one. Others provide pieces of what we do, but only gifting provides the complete package. We've developed key partnerships with national and local retail brands, and we've leveraged third-party white label delivery providers to limit overhead and allow for maximum flexibility as we look to scale. With experience from on-demand companies like Uber, Lyft, and Postmates, and the turnaround story of Ion Television, we've successfully grown companies from startup through exit, resulting in over $6 billion. Again, I'm Seth with Gifting, an on-demand gift-giving marketplace looking to change the way the world buys and sells gifts. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. All right, thank you, Seth. Okay, I have a question from Anna. Um, can you walk through specifically how this differs from Goody? All right, Pascal, Diane, how about you? Question for Seth. 
I'm a big believer in the space. Um, I'm in, in, in an indirect competitor called Sandoso or the B2B space. So big fan of the gifting space. Um, but also I know the, the, the challenges in logistics and, um, and in your case, like I'd, I'd love to know more about the curation of vendors, how you manage that and the expansion is very geographic. Um, so just speak to that. All right. Thank you so much. Back around the horn. Alice, Alejandra, question for Seth. Um, yeah, I think my main question was around logistics as well, but I guess more on the front end, um, I feel like gifting can be seasonal. So what's your strategy for increasing the use and just like having more use cases for it? All right, thanks so much. And we'll scribe one more. How about from the syndicate? Daylin's asking, are you looking only to US? Or are you planning to go overseas? If yes, where and how? All right, ready for this, Seth? Two minutes, please. I am. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Anna, to start with your question, how we differ from Goody, um, we're focused on the two-hour delivery. Goody is a great platform. They offer lots of uh, you know, opportunities for, for their users. But for us, it's about finding the right gift and getting that gift experience completed and perfect the first time. When we deliver the right item, it means that the consumer is happy and it also means that the retailer is happy and they're able to save. So for us, we're all about getting the gift right the first time and doing it in a very timely and efficient manner. Whereas Goody, majority of their work is, is done more on a corporate level and we're trying to create these personalized connections. Uh, Pascal, as it relates to Sutendoso, great company as well. I absolutely agree. Um, really what we're doing is we're focused on specific uh, mile radiuses of where users are. That's how we ensure that we're able to deliver the gift in such a timely manner. So for example, in our pilot market, we're pulling an eight mile radius. So we're partnering with three different types of retailers, enterprise retailers, national chains, re uh, regional, uh, and then the local mom and pop favorites. And we feel like there's a real benefit to the local community by being able to do that, to find those local heroes and be able to curate those items. We have a team that's in charge of going ahead and making sure that they are product market fit uh, items that are that people want. We're also using consumer research and consumer data, training our models on a daily basis as new orders come in to really make sure that we're being smart about the opportunities and, and what we're offering. Uh, Alejandra, as it relates to your question of being seasonal, uh, the one thing that we've learned is that people are using this platform for a whole bunch of different reasons. Yes, we have December and the December holidays and Valentine's Day and Mother's Day and Father's Day, but we're seeing use as it relates to birthdays, anniversaries, all different types of gift giving, get well soon, sympathies, whatever the case may be. So we really believe that this is a 365 day a year uh, platform. And finally, as it relates to expansion from the syndicate member, um, we are focused right now in the States and then maybe okay, what to expand sorry. in the future. <laughs> sorry. This is what follow up after is good for. Great job, everyone. All right. Thanks, Seth. Next up, Arjun from Suede. Oh, great. Arjun, can we hear you? Yes. Awesome. Can. Great. Three, two, go. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Arjun, co-founder of Suede, and we map and shape customer journeys in physical settings. Meet Mike. He's the managing director of our pilot customer, Hotel El Gonzo, and his guest, Anna. Mike's frustrated because he wants to understand how guests like Anna are spending time and money at his physical location but doesn't want to go through the hassle of installing additional hardware or having his guests download an app. Luckily, he has to do neither because he found Suede, and Anna, wanting a better experience on property, chooses to opt into Suede via the Wi-Fi captive page. At this point, we're able to understand where Anna is on property based on her mobile device's proximity to access points. So as she goes to the rooftop pool, to the gym, and then back to her room, we're able to create a full understanding of how she spent her time and money at this physical location. This data can be deployed in a multitude of ways. For example, Mike can target gym goers with a spa promotion that they'll receive when they're in their room and if it's raining outside. He can use that same workflow to message staff to leave a green juice in the rooms of health conscious travelers. And then finally, he can connect the offline and online journey by customizing the images that Anna receives on her rebooking email based on her activity on property. Mike's happy because we've mapped over 50,000 guest journeys at this point, and on average, Suede guests spend 18% more over the course of their stay, generating $20,000 in incremental revenue that he had no staff uh, contribute to. We have a satisfaction rate approaching 90%, and an opt-out rate well below 1%, 
and he has an unprecedented view of how people are spending time and money at his physical location. He put it best when he said Suede is offering a 360 solution that would be difficult to replace, and other apps are only doing a part of what Suede is doing now. We've gone live at four hotels, signing an additional two hotels, bringing our ARR to 35K, and as of this week, we'll be entering a new vertical for the first time at Vienna Airport in a collaboration with Austrian Airlines and Fraport. We differentiate ourselves from the competition because we require no behavior change from either the guest or the physical location. And our customer acquisition strategy involves capitalizing on our current pipeline of independent boutique hotels and the 31 airports in Fraport's portfolio, eventually parlaying that into relationships with the larger brands and airlines and tech vendors in the marketplace. We've adopted a simple SaaS model in the early days, pricing on a per room basis. But as we enter new verticals and our product becomes more mature, we'll be incorporating performance-based pricing and a data as a service module. We aim to hit 100 million in ARR by initially focusing on hotels and airlines, but eventually enter tangential environments like theme parks and even smart cities and mixed use developments. As a hotel owner myself, I understand the need for a solution like Suede firsthand, and with a team with backgrounds from companies like Disney and Uber, we're well equipped to build it. Thank you so much, and we're looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Arjun. Okay, investors, Andrea, question for Arjun. Yes, sorry, it just took me a minute there. Um, just, uh, we invest in something similar to this, which is like an indoor mapping solution. Um, but we ran into some privacy concerns. So I'm just wondering, you know, at the point of uh, capturing the initial guest check-in, I think you mentioned it was like when they were opting in for Wi-Fi, um, if there is any sort of legalese or something like that, that they know that they're opting in to, uh, you know, being tracked within the hotel and if they're okay with that. All right. Thank you, Andrea. Anna. My question was essentially the same, but I guess piggybacking off of that, then how do you like motivate guests to opt in? Um, what's the value prop to them? All right. Thank you. Atin. I don't have any questions. This is not my space. All right. Great. Um, I'll go to the syndicate here. Cold Up is asking, um, is Suede open to other properties such as gyms and sports clubs? Um, and Akul is asking, how costly is it to set up per hotel? And what is the value of the guests to adopt it? Which is sort of what I asked. All right, awesome. Two minutes, please, Arjun. Great. Um, so Andrea, I think that's a really key thing for us. Uh, we were kind of blessed in the early days to go live for the, with our first properties in Germany. So GDPR was built into the earliest versions of this product. So we do require explicit consent. We do tell the consumer that we are gathering their demographic data, their transactional history, and their device locations on property. And the value prop we offer them is a personalized and contact experience on property. And our opt-in rates have been very healthy. In Germany, it's around 65%, but in markets like Mexico, it's around 80 to 85%. Uh, Anna, in regards to the motivation of guests opting into this, uh, you know, we do offer them a personalized experience. And hospitality is this unique vertical where people actually explicitly want you to know who they are so they get treated differently and better when they're on property. And I think that differentiates ourselves from, you know, retail, for example. And I think what's key for us is our opt-out rate is well below 1% and is at 0.6%. So they're finding usefulness in what we're providing and an exciting experience. And we've validated that with satisfaction measurement as well. And then in regards to open to other environments, I think, you know, our recent, you know, involvement with the Vienna airport just shows that there is demand for personalization in physical space and tangential environments, whether it be gyms, whether it be universities, whether it be mixed use developments, we see broad application in a large TAM. All right, well done. Thanks, Arjun. Okay, next up we have Nick from LA. Nick, Thanks, can we? All right, awesome. Three, two, go. Hi, I'm Dr. Nikhil Pavaya, co-founder of Ellie. We're helping life science companies support chronic disease patients. This is Kiara. Unfortunately, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and needs treatments from life science companies. This has left her anxious, overwhelmed, and lonely. When she needs confidence support, she turns to Ellie. Kiara starts by opening her iPhone app and listens to her daily Ellie. 
Hi, it's Ellie. You are planting seeds for personal growth today. Look after them and they will continue to bloom. Kiara can also watch exercise videos from instructors living with chronic conditions who understand her limitations. Then Kiara can listen to meditations from Alex who had cancer as a young adult. Each day, we'll come together to explore a fresh topic so that we can approach our day with a new way of thought, and then we'll meditate together. Kiara can then dive into over 2,000 patient stories so she can learn from over 100 patients like Ariana. For me, staying mentally healthy and implementing self-love first came from acceptance. Kiara can also check in with Ellie to record her emotions and her symptoms. Overall, with Ellie, Kiara feels significantly healthier and happier. Patients who spend just 30 days with Ellie improve their quality of life on average by 15%. This is a result that no other product or trial has ever achieved. Ellie also increases treatment adherence by 40%, which is compelling for pharma as they miss out on significant revenue from non-adherence. So we license B2B to pharma by selling data and content experiences. For our data license, customers like J&J pays $50 per patient per year, and we give their oncology team insights on when patients have side effects. Directors like Roni value working with us as patients stay on treatments for longer, meaning her team increases their drug revenue targets. For our content license, customers like BMS pay us 5K per brand per month, and we give their patients custom audio content for drugs like Eliquis. Managers like Trip love that Ellie reminds patients to take Eliquis each day. Because they're more compliant, he's already lining up other drugs in their portfolio that we plan to upsell into. I've spent 10 years looking after patients as a physician, so I've seen firsthand a lot of the pain points that our users and their families go through. And as an investor myself, I value the importance of finding product market fit, which is why we've been focused on growing revenue with our key offerings. Since our launch, we've already hit $240,000 in revenue with a further 1 mil ARR in our pipeline. We've achieved these milestones with working with some great customers and we're supporting over 11,000 users. They listen on average to 190 minutes of total LA content. As we sign up new customers, we plan to upsell across 50 chronic conditions and address a total obtainable market of $100 million conservatively within the next three years. Unlike competitors, our app has a rich audio experience, content on patient education, and better accessibility. I'm joined by my co-founder, Cecilia and Simon. Our previous startups are currently valued at over $250 million. We've sold to Pharma in the past and know how to keep these sales cycles to under four months. For Ellie, we're already backed by some reputable investors, including Google, Bayer, Snap, and Morgan Stanley. I'm Nick, co-founder of Ellie. We're helping chronic disease patients live healthier and happier. And I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Nick. All right, investors, David, you're up next, please. Question for Nick. I, I love that you're trying to help this space. It, it sounds like you're monetizing, as you mentioned, through Big Farm. Um, it, it seems to me that it is tied to usage in terms of the pricing. So I'm curious, when you market it, how much of that heavy lift is on your shoulders versus the doctors versus the, um, the payers? And um, do you get access to the who's on these different meds and on these different treatments? All right. Thank you, David. Pascal Unger. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so our, uh, selling to pharma is, is, a, is a good business, um, as I understand, but it only works if you actually have um, the user base. Um, and so can, us, can you tell us a little bit more um, how you're thinking about um, acquiring all these users, um, especially given that the, that the space for, for apps and, and mental wellness and well-being um, is incredibly crowded already, even though you're, you're slightly differentiating yourself? Thank you, Pascal. Pascal Dion. Not a space I'm very familiar with, but I'm also very curious about the go-to-market uh, on both sides, uh, acquisition of, of customers and, and, and the pharma company. All right, great. Let's try to grab one more. Alejandro. Um, yeah, I, I have a question related to your business model. Um, have you thought about charging any kind of like success fee, uh, taking on more economic risk reward if if metrics improve like drug yield or something like that. Thanks. All right, terrific. Thanks for the questions. All right, you have two minutes, Nick, please. Yeah, thanks for those questions, everyone. So I'll start first with David, uh, which overlap with uh, both Pascal's questions. So on the kind of monetizing through pharma side, um, we actually receive marketing spend budget from some of the pharma customers we work with. So j, &J actually gave us 50K to actually acquire patients on their behalf. So that's one way that we work with pharma. Another way is we can actually sign up patients um, through hospital partners that they have in place already. 
Um, so there is a bit of a lift in terms of uh, the onboarding, but it's quite simple if we can use digital channels like not just uh, Apple Search, Facebook, Instagram, but also other channels like TikTok, Snapchat, and Reddit, which we've shown uh, to be quite effective as well. Um, Pascal, you asked about um, the, the user base and how we acquire our users. So we not just acquire users through our pharma partners, we also partner with a lot of hospitals. So some of the hospitals and health systems we partnered with include uh, Cedar sinai Duke, Oshner, and Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we basically give them uh, digital brochures or physical brochures that they hand to their patients. And for us, that's a flywheel to better understand which drugs patients are on. So we can go to a Novartis and we can say, hey, we've got 10 of your patients taking this drug. Here's another way we can actually service them in a more personalized uh, kind of manner. Um, Pascal, you asked about the, the marketing strategy. So yes, we work with pharma and hospitals, like I mentioned. We also partner with nonprofits as well as our contributors who create content with us. So they in themselves are micro-influencers. So we basically give them a code, which they can then distribute to their own audiences. And then across with that, along with word of mouth, is how we've been acquiring users to date. Um, Alejandra, uh, I think, yeah, the pricing is still early days. We've got some early customers to date. I think over time, as you mentioned, having that adherence and tangible metric around the value of adherence over time is going to demonstrate uh, and justify a stronger and higher pricing. We've started with this pricing because we've sold to pharma with budgets uh, to date and in the past. But over time, you're, you're right. We should be evolving this. Um, thanks for your questions, everyone. All right, well done, Nick. All right, next up we have Carlene from Enriched HQ. Are you ready, Carlene? Carlene, can we hear you? I okay. am, I am, okay. I am, I am. All right, I see okay. your screen. Awesome, okay. you ready? Three, two, go. Thank you. Hi, everybody, I'm Carlene from Enriched HQ, and we are fighting $1 trillion in volunteer employee turnover by helping kids. Um, and how is that even um, possible? Well, let's take a look at attrition in general. In, in spite of industry-wide layoffs, economic downturn, a pandemic, and massive changes in the way we, we live and work, $1 trillion is actually the 2019 number the U.S. organizations incurred from volunteer uh, turnover, and it's expanding at an alarming rate. Companies are frantic to put programs in place to um, retain their most valuable employees. Like our customer Adobe here and their employee April, even well below the 35% national average at 3%, they suffer $78 million in employee volunteer turnover every single year. And they're asking employees like April, 16 years, career, six-figure salary, and a major recent promotion, why she's leaving. And she's telling them, because as her kids grow older, they no longer can partake in any of the family programs available from Adobe. So she spends like $3,000 a month on extracurricular skills building activities for boys, just so that she can work. She's stressed out and she feels like she has no choice. Well, this is where we come in to help April and Adobe. We're a centralized hub of skills building and life skills programs for school-age kids grades four and up. Think about masterclass, but for juniors. And because we're a turnkey solution, April's kids can immediately get access to tutoring from the likes of Sylvan or engage in an entrepreneur boot camp taught by a Harvard professor. And because of the Adobe corporate program, Many of these are, av are available free for April because after all, Adobe wants to keep her and April wants to stay. And that is exactly why we focus our model on B2B and the DEI sector, which is outside of competitive HR benefits uh, funding. We profit through corporate cr customer uh, annual recurring contracts, monthly subscriptions from our partners, and a take rate on everything we've booked on the platform. Today, we service over 220,000 global employees from our flagship customers, and we're growing 36% month over month. Being B2B is a massive differentiator for us as others focus on educational and consumer markets, because every time a corporate customer is onboarded, all of their employees become beneficiaries of our program. 
which will quickly lead us to almost 100 million by 2025. We have the DEI, sales, operations, and tech leadership to execute. And that's how we fight volunteer attrition. Thank you, I'm Carlene. Happy to take your questions. All right. Thank you, Carlene. Okay, investors, Andrea, question for Carlene. Yes, yeah, sounds like um, definitely a good program. I'm just curious, though, you mentioned Adobe, which is a great um, customer, by the way, but how long is the sales cycle to sign up uh, corporations and or do you also have uh, a long tail sales strategy where some of the smaller corporations could just do, you know, self signups for your program? Thank you, Andrea. Anna. Kind of a two-part question. So one, how do you measure success? And then two, how do you kind of attribute employee retention if that's the metric to enrich HQ? All right, thank you. And Atin dropped a question in the chat. What's the utilization rate for your best and worst performing activities? All right, and I think we had uh, four questions there because Anna asked two, so I'll let you tackle those. Carlene, you have two minutes, please. Okay, awesome questions. Thank you. Um, so the first one is how long is the sales cycle from Andrea um, and a long tail strategy? So the first part of it is um, my background is uh, I have about 15 years in B2B technology sales. So it's in my blood. I know how to navigate these very large organizations. What we're seeing is about six to eight months that will take us from initial introduction through to procurement. Um, and the long tail with smaller companies, yes, we are looking into strategies that allow um, smaller corporations, less than a thousand employees to engage with the platform directly and, and sign up. Um, measuring success. Uh, so for each of our partners, we track um, the various metrics around what is selling, what isn't selling, um, and we uh, work directly with the partners on whether or not it's fitting within their business model um, so that it's profitable for them, because we do believe that rising tides raise all boats, um, and we also measure how many activities are growing month over month. Um, as a whole and individually and all of sort of the, what revenue um, uh, we're generating there. So standard metrics on marketplace activity. Um, how do we attribute to Anna to um, employee retention? We work with um, the corporate clients to set our KPIs at the beginning of our engagement. Some of those are um, setting targets around active, how do we engage them, how, um, how many are engaged in the platform, um, and then we bump that up against their HR data on um, what their attrition rate overall is. It, our business case is very easy to make because we are very, very cost effective. Okay, I'm sorry, Carlene. <laughs> Do some follow-up after. Thank, Thank you. you. Team, great, great call. job on that. Two minutes Thank is you. tough. Um, all right. And for our seventh founder, we have Zeb from Legal Q. You ready to go, Zeb? I am. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Terrific. Three, two, go. Hi, everybody. I'm Zeb from Legal Q. And the problem that we're solving for today is that two thirds of Americans have an ongoing legal issue at any given time, and only half of those get resolved. Meanwhile, the attorneys that want to help with this have to spend 45% of their time managing and marketing instead of actually being attorneys. So how does this work? This is Kira. She's an anonymized user who used LegalQ recently when she got kicked out of her apartment. Her current options are to Google this. Oh, cool. She sees a free website where she can use, except she hits the paywall like everybody else. Instead, Travis is an attorney also on LegalQ and is looking for someone like Kira to help. So how does this work? Kira downloads the app and in a simple three-step process, she's able to simply and effectively enter her information, enter her legal situation, and in three screens, she's chatting with an attorney. So I should mention this, that this is by far the simplest mechanism for onboarding a user on any legal tech platform. And you can see here that Travis has a web app that he can use to look over the question, 
And once they have that connection, he's able to simply and effectively resolve it for her for free for a 15 minute chat. And if he does a great job, like one out of five of the attorneys on the platform, he might have a lifelong client. So the next day he wakes up to see that he has two hours available on his calendar. And LegalQ is able to simply and effectively auto schedule all four of those consultations on his calendar based on his requirements. So our pricing for this is simple. Users pay zero bucks. Attorneys pay us between 25 and 700 per consultation. And the legal tech landscape, guys, is fractured and ripe for disruption. LegalQ is the only app to offer on-demand text, voice, and video chat without ever charging the user and the simplest onboarding. But truly, our secret sauce is the LegalQ Knowledge Cloud, which utilizes over 100,000 first, second, and third-party data source sets to have the best routing engine of any NLP engine on the internet. Uh, how we're gonna get there, we're gonna grow our markets from 14 today to 38 by the end of the year, expand the LegalQ Knowledge Cloud and the first 100 paying customers in November. What does 100 paying customers mean? It means a million in ARR. At the end of five years, at 10,000 customers, we're gonna be at 100 million in ARR. And our traction to get there so far, we have 7,000 downloads across both platforms, 112 attorneys on 14 states, and our 100K is gonna be hit in December. We truly have a world-class team to execute on this. Between us, we have uh, four master's degrees, two JDs, one PhD, and one former NHL player. Honestly, everything else aside, our mission, guys, is to enable 1 million people to get legal help from 50,000 attorneys in all 50 states by 2025. That's why we're here. That's our mission. And we hope you join us on this journey. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Zeb. Well done. Atin, question for Zeb. I haven't got one. I had some more notes. Okay, David. How does the early funnel look of those 7,000 um, downloads and 100 attorneys? How many um, video conferences have they had and how many have converted into actual appointments? And Thank you, David. Maybe, maybe it's early, but how many have even come back for a second consultation? All right, terrific. Thanks so much. Pascal Unger. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so second David's question, and then also, um, right, it is a very um, noisy market with, as I said, the Avos, Legal Shield, even Upwork, and so on of the world. Um, and even if you have a slightly differentiated offering, um, how do you think about kind of positioning yourself and, and messaging it? How do you think about rising above the noise, um, especially from a consumer perspective? All right, terrific. Let's grab some from the syndicate. Andy's asking, marketplaces are notoriously hard to build as you need both supply and demand density. How do you solve this chicken and egg problem? Um, and Todd's asking, are you having a harder time getting attorneys or users with legal questions? Those are great questions. You have two minutes for those, Seb. All right, thanks everybody. Great questions. So David, to your question, uh, how does our early funnel look? Uh, basically, uh, from the 7,000 users that we've had download the app, we've had probably uh, a third of those turn into actual consultations that are um, in action with these attorneys along the way. And from that, uh, we have about 10% of those that come back or have come back for a second consultation request with additional attorneys for additional areas. Uh, but it is uh, paid per consultation from the attorney side. So if the user does um, you know, ask multiple questions or want a second opinion, then it's, uh, you know, LegalQ would receive revenue from both of those requests. Um, the video conferences, it's actually interesting. Uh, in the data, we see about 70% choose text, about 20% voice, and only about 10% choose video. So uh, that's not something I would have guessed, but basically uh, in that context, um, our longer term strategy is to enable a um, basically training set for a machine learning algorithm to say, hey, the last 5,000 times this question has been asked in California, here's the best answer for that. So the attorneys look like geniuses. And then ultimately someday we're gonna enable that to be a um, API that we can just you know, license to Google or somebody to enable access to legal questions globally. Um, Pascal, to your question about noisy market, it is noisy, uh, but the, honestly, there's about seven good legal apps in the United States today. Um, it's a highly regulated market, tons of regulatory capture. And you know, LegalQ has done our diligence on ensuring that we play by those rules, but it also creates somewhat of a moat um, around it once we have this kind of market effects and network effects kicking in. Uh, the marketplace, it is hard to build, but the, uh, the easier side, um, we have Anthony Brunetti on our call today, our CMO, he's brilliant. Uh, he handles a lot of the performance marketing pieces to that. 
and he got our CACs down from about 150 to about 15 this uh, this summer currently. So basically, the attorneys we can do through multiple channels, and then we know that we have the ability to do that. And Todd, I'll answer your question offline. So thank you guys. All right, well done. Okay, that is our cohort. Well done, founders. Um, investor judges, now comes the hard part. We are going to ask you to give us your top three of those great seven, um, usually in the lens of, you know, um, investment, but, you know, we understand that you may not have three companies in your wheelhouse and that's okay. Um, so when I call on you, as we did for the intros, I'll call on you in alphabetical order. Can you give us your three in backwards order? Builds a little suspense. So my number three is X, my number two is Y. You don't need to say Y. But then when you say you're number one, we will ask you to just say a few words about why you voted that company number one. Um, and while you're mm. thinking about that, we are going to so launch exciting. a poll for our, our syndicate members. Thank you for coming. Um, you can only do your top choice. Um, and I'm going to ask our guest investor judges to not look at the poll. Do not let that influence you, please. <laughs> so go ahead and launch the poll. And we'll keep that open for about a minute while our guest investor judges are thinking. Put that off to the oh, side. It's so exciting. So exciting. Great job, everybody. And great job to Jackie. Uh, anybody who wants to uh, unmute and give Jackie a round of applause for running the 25th accelerator class. Feel free to do that. You give some we snaps love you, and everything. Yeah, Jackie. Oh, yes. Way to go. Um, <laughs> the reports back are, it was another excent uh, and inspiring effort. So, really uh, great amazing, job to all the companies. Class. Great job to my team. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, listen, if you had, um, graduated last year, you would have been raising at a $100 million valuation and you'd have $20 million in the bank. Um, but now you actually have to work for it. You got to really be dogged. You got to raise revenue. You got to look at the bottom line. Uh, and thus the cycle starts again. But this is great for this particular group of companies because you all have real businesses with real customers. The, the companies that really benefited the last two or three years were great storytellers, often without great traction or great execution, uh, if I'm being candid. And now uh, the the uh, pendulum has swung back to the actual builders of companies and enterprises and products. So uh, all seven of the companies here are really good at actually building great product and delighting customers. So you'll benefit from this change in the market. Okay. I think I filibustered right. enough there. <laughs> all right. Let's do that. We'll, it's we'll a mini close. filibuster. We'll, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll close our syndicate poll. So let's close that out. And we will call on our investor judges. So Alejandra, I will ask you first, can you give us your top three um, in backwards order, three, two, and then one and Y? Okay. Perfect. Oh, wait. Number yep, one you pick can, is... Uh, no, in, in backwards order. So your number three is... Okay. Yeah. My number three is Ellie. Chatter and suede. Um, suede, is your, suede is your number one and why? Please. I really love the idea of bringing the analog world to digital, um, especially starting with a very specific use case and then sort of expanding on to the next one. All right. Terrific. Thank you so much. Andrea. Okay. So I have a little image. I don't know if anyone can see it, but I recently went to LA. You probably can't see it because it's probably blurred. But anyways, I had an apple, a bottled water, M&Ms, and a Kind Bar all wrapped in plastic <laughs> when I checked into my hotel room. Oh, so anyway, it's tells me, I know it tells me that number three uh, is my, uh, is, you know, is my number third choice. Uh, spring, spring eats, sorry. <laughs> Too many uh, things going on in my desk. So number three is spring eats because of the wrapped plastic idea, which I think is ridiculous. Uh, number two is Ellie, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, because it's near and dear to my heart. I have a very dear family member that's going through chemotherapy right now. And number one is chatter. Um, and that is primarily because I think um, it is prime for disruption in the manufacturing space. I still want to learn a little bit more about this, the box. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm sold on the box idea, but uh, I come from a background of heavy data analytics working at Google. And that is why that is my number one. Thank you, Andrea. Anna. Oh, Anna. And I just want to ask you, did you get to see chatter? Because if you didn't, we still want to know your top three, but we won't use the points. I did get to see chatter. Okay, great. Just check in. I want to be fair. Um, All right, go, go for it. Cool. So three is suede, two is legal Q, and one is Ellie Health. Um, the early traction seems impressive. The chronic disease market is massive, and um, the team seems to have built a unique platform. So congrats. Thanks, Anna. All right, cool. Three different number ones so far. Atin, you're up next, please. 
Thanks, Jackie. Thanks to, to all of the companies that presented. I think everything was, uh, was quite interesting. Um, my uh, choices in reverse order are Legal Queue, Enriched HQ, and Chatter. Um, specifically, Chatter for number one, because that's a space that I'm, I'm intimately familiar with. I did a lot of hardware investing, um, hardware and deep tech investing. So, specifically, um, have looked at that space, and um, there's just a lot of opportunity, lots of potential there. Um, so, yeah, keen to, keen to dive more uh, into the business with Pete. Thank you very much. David. Thanks, everyone, for let, letting me join. It was great seeing everything. Um, I, number three was Chatter, number two was Suede. And similar to Anna, I picked Ellie as my number one, and it's largely because I was impressed by the clinical outcomes and the early traction selling in the pharma. Thank you, David. Pascal Unger. Yeah, so I've chatted at three, Legal Q at two, and then also um, Ellie at one partially because it is very hard to um, get traction um, with big pharma out of the gate. They can scale quite quickly if you nail that. Um, and then also just the fact that they're going after the chronic disease market, which is a giant one. All right, thank you. And Pascal, Diane. Um, number three, gifting. Uh, number two, Enrich IQ, uh, Enrich HQ, sorry. And number one, Chatter. And Chatter, because it's a massive market, there's a lot of competition, but if executed correctly, it could be a massive success. All right, a few things here. Okay, so Andre will calculate those. First, we'll talk about the uh, the poll. It looks like Chatter, this is the syndicate poll, syndicate members, Chatter is number one, um, Suede is number two, and Legal Q is number three. All right, so we have a couple more scores to give. Andre, what is our score for today for our guest judges here? All right, everyone, thanks for voting. So in third today, we have Suede, in second, we have Ellie, and in first, we have Chatter. All right, great. And just for everyone, we do this every week at the Accelerator. We bring in 10 to 20 investors and go through this every week. And so we track the scores over time. So this is the last class. And Andre, what are our final, who are our final top three? The grand total in third is Suede, in second is Ellie, and in first is Chatter. Fantastic. Right. Well done, everybody. Um, and it's great to get that feedback from investors and the investors typically give such rich feedback. It allows the founders in aggregate to see some trends. Oh, maybe they're concerned about our business model. Maybe they're concerned about the size of the market. And you know, while no one investor's uh, feedback is you know um, perfect or you know should change the direction of a company, I think if you do get a couple of hundred people uh, who are capital allocators giving you feedback it's directionally going to be quite accurate. And that is part of the magic of the program is that we record all that, we study it, we really take it to heart and think about why are investors saying this. It doesn't mean that the entire group of investors, uh, we could be wrong, but um, often it's because we've seen this movie before, having invested in collectively thousands of companies. Uh, so great job again to all the companies. Thanks to everybody for coming. Follow up with the companies, take a meeting with them, give them great advice. And if you're so inclined, pick a couple that you want to invest in and uh, place a bet. Uh, it is a bet uh, and it's a great bet to make because it's a hopeful bet on uh, companies and entrepreneurs to build products and services to make the world a little bit better. So thanks to everybody. If you've got a great company that you think would benefit from our program, uh, we're, we're continuing to do a half dozen of these classes a year. We love doing it. We, we love supporting founders. Two ways to do it. Founder University, if you've just got an idea, you're not even incorporated yet, uh, you can do that program or Launch Accelerator and you can just email Jackie. All right. Thanks, Jackie. Let's give it up one more time for Jackie and her team. Oh, Snaps no. up for Jackie. For the founders. She hates it when we do founders. this. Yeah, the founders already got their shine. Now it's time to give Jackie some shine. She hates it. Give it that big applause. Everybody say thank you, Jackie. We love you, Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. Yeah, she hates Jackie. when everybody does that. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> Thanks to everyone right. for coming. Great to see, see you. you. We'll time. see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. So long. Farewell. All right, we have a we have our Zoom debrief ready to go. All right, let's jump jump off and jump onto that. See you guys soon. Bye everyone.